Good afternoon, everyone. I am Commerce Next co-founder Veronica Sansev. And for those that are new, Commerce Next is a community event series and conference for marketers at retail and direct to consumer brands. And on behalf of my fellow co-founders, Scott Silverman and Alan Dick, I wanna welcome you to our second webinar of 2022. Our topic for today is a new year, new email marketing strategies. And given that retention has had renewed focus, we wanted to spend some time revisiting the most popular retention strategy, which of course is email and messaging. In fact, when Commerce Next conducted its digital trends and investment survey earlier this year, 87% of you said that email was your top retention priority. So today we're gonna to discuss personalizing email, um, email marketing and messaging, optimizing send time, scaling creative, and much more. But before we dig in, I want to walk through a few important thank yous and announcements. So first, I want to thank our um, I want to thank Coherent Path. They've been helping brands optimize and personalize their email marketing programs, and we are delighted to partner with them on this webinar. I also want to thank our speakers. Julie Evans, Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer at Omaha Stakes, Jenna Posner, VP of Digital at Snipes, Chad Gorehouse, Email Marketing Manager at Front, Frontgate, and Greg LeBond, CTO at Coherent Path. This week's speakers are experts when it comes to email marketing and messaging, and we are lucky to have them join us today. We'll be sending our speakers thank you gifts via our gifting partner gift now as a small token of our appreciation. But the good news is we'll also be sending five lucky audience members gifts as well. Um, audience members are randomly selected from the group that is tuning in live. So sorry for anyone who is watching the replay. We recently announced that registrations open for our annual summit June 21st and 22nd at the New York Hilton Midtown. The summit will cover topics such as setting up shop in the metaverse, scaling TikTok influencers, and winning the war on talent in addition to our usual marketing and e-commerce topics. You can apply to attend at commercenext.com. We are also hosting a Commerce Next reception at Shop Talk, if you're going to Shop Talk in Vegas. It'll take place on Sunday, March 27th at Top Golf. You know, it's gonna be a lot of fun in addition to being a fabulous opportunity to reconnect with the Commerce Next community. You'll also have a chance to practice your golf swing, play bar games like pool and darts, or just relax with a nice cocktail. This event is for retailers and brands only. If you're interested in joining, you can email alan at commercenext.com for an invite. Our next webinar, which will be in two weeks, is on how to collaborate to unlock great e-commerce experiences. Again, it's in two weeks. It takes place on February 9th, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific time. It features BNH, Madison Reed, um, Clorox, and our friends at Glassbox. And you can learn more at commercenext.com. And then finally, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our podcast. The most recent episode features Bloom Reach Chief Strategy Officer Brian Walker, who talks about e-commerce, career growth, and culture lessons from his time at Amazon. He also shares some interesting predictions for 2022, so check it out. Um, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. Now, if you missed any of our past events, both our virtual events as well as in-person events, you can find the replays on YouTube at youtube.com slash Commerce Next. Um, and there's a wealth of content on there, so make sure to subscribe and you'll get updates as we add new videos. So housekeeping items. Um, don't worry if you miss anything. Those who have come to our webinars before know that we record these and they're usually available. Um, the recording is usually available by the next day. Um, I'm going to quickly show you where everything is on the screen for those that are new, and then we'll jump into the content. So the panel on the right is the main panel for interactivity. It has chat, Q&A, polls, and handouts. Chat is where you can interact, uh, is where you can give our speakers high fives, interact with other audience members. It's where you have the general engagement. But if you have a specific question, um, and we will ask your questions during the panel portion of the webinar, we ask you to use the QA tab. And that's because it has some additional functionality, which I'll show you in a second. So you ask your question, um, you click on the QA tab, 
put the question in on the bottom. And then um, once the question is live, there's an opportunity to upvote questions. Now for those, even if you don't, even if you haven't asked a question, check that out because by upvoting the questions that you think are interesting, it helps us prioritize those for the panelists. And then finally, um, in the handout section is where you can download the slides from today. Um, so um, that's just the fourth tab in that, in that right-hand panel. Um, and for those that are watching the replay, um, those handouts are available on the bottom of your player. So today's agenda, we have a presentation on managing customer conversations by Greg Lebone, CTO Career Path, and Chad Gorehouse, email marketing at Frontgate. Then we're going to ask you some questions via our, via our audience polls. And then we have a panel discussion with Omaha Snakes, Snipes, and Coherent Path. So with that, please join me in welcoming Greg and Chad to our virtual stage. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And I'll, I'll turn this over to you now. OK, great. Thank you. I am the Chief Technology Officer here at uh, Coherent Path, where we provide uh, email solutions. We do a, my background is as a mathematician. It'd be a little bit of a warning. I like to take the sort of abstract view of what's going on here. But we're very lucky that Chad uh, from Frontgate is joining us to kind of get the practical side, as well as a sort of abstraction of what problem are we trying to solve? So I like the title of this because I think we are managing a customer conversation is the way we like to think of the problem. And that's something that takes place over a long period of time. It's something that involves moments where you moments where you react and moments where you initiate conversations. And of course, the email channel is a great place for initiating conversations. And I think during our panel, we'll talk about how it relates uh, to other ways in which you can initiate the conversation. But when you have this conversation, the goal of the conversation is pretty simple. And so we'll get a little bit of maybe a background. Here's the file is your email file. And your goal is to have the right sequence of emails out there to get that to have the longest term revenue as a file as the set of customers you can have conversations with, and in the process to describe your value proposition to each one, which can have different levels of complexity. Just as a little background, we started Coherent Path with the idea that a lot of personalization is very next step focused, and it's not thinking about the fact that over time you have an engagement with this customer that has to be managed, especially at these moments where you're initiating the conversation and you're initiating the new topics of conversation. And we like to think of this as a, of optimizing for what's going to happen for the long-term value and the long-term state of that relationship. That, uh, th that's a very complicated kind of problem to think about. Uh, and uh, we're going to go through a couple of pieces of it. And we're going to phrase it at a high level as answering a couple of questions. Is that as you go along this relationship with your customer and you're having this conversation, you have to know what to say. And that's pretty clear. But the conversation, a very important part of it, is also how often to say something. How often do you want to initiate a conversation uh, with the customer? And we're going to spend some time focusing on that because it's something that I think is a very hot topic right now amongst uh, a lot of people in retail. So, but we're going to start with what to say. So I have here a uh, I have here a picture from this is from Frontgate's uh, so Chad's uh, Frontgate library, a piece of creative. And what we say, there's a lot of goals around what we want to say. You might want to say the best thing for somebody, so have that message as personalized as possible. And you might want to have it optimized in the sense that there's a bunch of pictures you can take. Which one would have the most value, and can you figure it out? And you want to learn from the reactions. All of that has to say that that creative, when you put it into the world, you've got to keep a certain amount of flexibility in the system. And I'm thinking of the strategy that I want us to focus on as maybe called optimized creative flexibility. So when I look at that piece of creative, there are various things that I can do with it. How do I make the most use out of it, both with regard to bringing value and with regard to learning about the system and understanding my customers better? The first step, I think, is to, is to understand what it means to leverage a single piece of creative in the system. Now, and everybody's working in different CMSs and so forth, trying to figure this out. But in email, it's a very special place to, to think about how this works, because I think there's a lot of one and done thinking in email where you create it and you kind of throw it away and the creative, how it works together can be a little bit complicated. Here we're suggesting that it has some real power to go in and try to think about how can I get more use out of that creative and use it uh, in particular in different places in the email. So this image 
I don't know if you can see my little arrow when I spin things around here. I'm hoping you can. The there's you know the, in the whole email, this content could be used. There could be a version that even helps it enforce your banner. A version in the hero here. It's one of uh, 700 different things that this in this email that one could be looking at, or it can be used in other lower zones of the email, different parts of the email where you're trying to continue the conversation. More than that, it can be used in different emails, different templates. And I think from my perspective as the sort of mathematician, used in different campaigns, meaning that this, this can be used over time. So right now on the right-hand side, I'm looking at how do you think about a creative when you're setting it up? What is a creative? And I've picked the very first thing one has to think about when saying a creative is when can I use it? So in this case, this creative uh, can be used for a long period of time. It goes from all the way from December into January is when they when we were happy to be using this piece of creative. And the reason what the reasons we like that are that it's a real opportunity to bring value with the creative. And I'm saying this in part because when we built this coherent path tool, one of the very key problems was a machine learning problem, which is that. I can say, I can look at my historical creative and make all kinds of decisions, but nothing replaces putting something into the world and seeing how people react and see how that reaction interacts with the current you know, context of the world. So one of the things that we, that we encourage to think about creative flexibility is how do you put it into the world in a structured way where you have a chance to learn about it and then to reuse it as well. So another thing, once you have a range of creative can be used, it can be re and there's a tremendous amount of value lurking in being able to get the best stuff out there, learn what's best, and then reuse and optimize the use of those things uh, in the world. And it doesn't just apply to uh, being able to kind of create the most revenue in the situation, keeping the creative uh, flexible. It can also reduce your effort. So this is a good example. This is the same email, same piece of creative. And this is in its ability to drive the email. So where it drives the actual engagement the person first sees, the inbox experience, the subject line of where they're going. It can be very nice to think of having multiple subject lines for a creative because one of the things when you initiate conversations and you initiate them in email, you know you're gonna get something like a 20, 25% response rate. It is not always going to be successful in trying to uh, get the person involved, but it could be the very best thing in your library. That image is the thing that most shows off your brand and getting multiple uses out of it in a structured way allows you um, to do two things. One, get it out there in the world, get the most use out of that creative. But secondly, be able to make a little less creative specifically around that and maybe diversify your creative. So one of the, one of the advantages of being able to reuse and have a place that's managing this creative in a good way with regard to email is that you can now spend your energy diversifying sort of the personas in your system that you'd like to, uh, to, to engage with uh, with different content. So if we looked at that first slide, there's 700 different pieces of creative because you can have a chance to learn who likes what and how to utilize it and get kind of deeper into that world. So there's a lot of, a lot of the complexity of what happens here uh, is that there's a lot to keep track of. There is a, you have this, these 75 of 700 creatives, you've got to build things. There's a practical side to saying, if I'm going to keep my creative flexible, then I'm going to need to have some kind of tooling to make it flexible, some sort of management system. And we think we've built a really nice one that, to think about the problem and to abstract it. And I think I wanted to give uh, Chad, who uses this all the time at Frontgate, a chance to uh, speak about how, you know, how he uses this system. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, and so just to give everybody a little context as well, uh, you know, I'm the email manager at Frontgate. And uh, we've been working in the Coherent Path tool for a little over two years now. We've been a fantastic partner. And, you know, it's one thing to kind of say, hey, we want to do email personalization, but it's another to kind of see how does that really come to life? How do you execute those things? How, do you, how does that both achieve some of the goals of personalization as well as your existing brand objectives? And so we want to put together a slide here to just try to give a little more uh, background into how we actually execute our campaigns, how um, all of these different pieces come together in one cohesive email, and how we can kind of manipulate those things to still get personalization, but also stay aligned with our brand objectives. And so this slide kind of, if you can, if you're looking at the at the left side here, we have a number of different content areas in our existing email template. We really have two different types of assets that we build for our email 
programs or program. Um, promo banners, which you see an example of that at the very top, and then one kind of in the middle email, and then what we call hero assets, right? And so the promo banners are tied pretty tightly to our daily promote cadences, what are what offers are we running, things like that. You kind of see an example there, 25% off site-wide, plus unlimited shipping uh, for just 149. And then uh, our hero areas in here are more creative-based imagery, you know, we have a a uh, very wide breadth of products that we offer at Frontgate. And so personalization is a really good fit for some of our brand objectives. But as you know, we're executing our daily campaigns, maybe we want to focus more on one type of product versus another. And so this the example of this really is um, you know, with that offer there that you see free shipping on off, or on orders over 149, we tend to focus more on big purchase like furniture items that ship more expensive because 149 shipping on a, a bath towel isn't that enticing. So when we set up and execute our campaigns in that top hero there, we're selecting assets that really connect with that offer and resonate with that offer. We're still using personalization, but it's within the context of that offer. Uh, if you drop down to the, or if you look down at the two lower heroes there, um, we're selecting images that are broader, that better represent all of the categories that we offer. Uh, and kind of really connect with the consumer and, and really communicate the breadth of our products. The two pro banners, again, I should probably mention too, will lock that for 100% of our people, so, or for our subscribers, so that everybody is seeing the same thing. Uh, it's really the more the content that personalizes. And so you see kind of what the end result is over on the right side of the screen there. And so a couple of the things I just want to kind of point out with this is, you know, when you think about email person, Really, uh, we kind of let the system tell us when they're not working anymore, when uh, it's time to kind of age them out of our system and um, start to focus and load in new assets. We are constantly loading new assets because we found that fresh creative is, is a huge component of performance, but um, some assets just work over time and seem to resonate for longer periods than others. So uh, that was kind of what I was going to cover there. I'll throw it back to you, Greg. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chan. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yes, so that is the creative. We are going to move on to something that we're going to see it re It is very much so interacts with the creative and being able to build the emails as, as Chad was talking about. But it's how often do you say something to kind of decide you know what you're going to say and then you need to decide if you're going to say something. This is a uh, today, you know, people are doing various things. For one thing, you've got to decide on an active full file that you're going to send to, and then decide if you're going to send once a week or three times a day. you got to make some choices about what to do with that. Uh, pretty suboptimal. A lot of people are also breaking it up into, say, the really engaged part, the part that has a lull in the conversation that needs a re-engagement, treating new customers in a way to kind of bring them in. And then there's all the way to the point of trying to personalize how much how much volume you're going to send different people, sort of a high, medium, and low, or maybe to the point of a model. I think that right now the tension in the world is that frequency, it's always been a hard thing to study but and, and to be able to make choices about, but we are in the midst of some very big changes in how we manage even what we think of as our active file, let alone the sort of frequency problem. And I think I'm gonna to point to this graph to kind of, this is just a graph I pulled out of our system to see. There's a thing that I'm calling a nopen, which is nope, it is not an open. These are the things that currently Apple is doing where the Apple will open every email uh, that goes through their system. So the user does not initiate the open. They're now opened by the uh, mailbox provider and about, and that graph is over time. Those are the weeks back. So about, uh, well, in October, early October, uh, a strange thing happened in the world where suddenly uh, a huge chunk of the opens that were flowing through the system were in fact invalid. It is up to the point now where 70% of the opens that are flowing through our system, for example, are are not valid any longer. They are the ones being opened by the machine. And this is having some very big impacts on even what you call the active file you want to email to because you can no longer use most recent opened. You're gonna have to make some kind of compromise. There are different sorts of compromises that you could make. Uh, you could remove, uh, you could identify and remove the bad opens, but of course, then that shrinks the file from the people who, you know, they were honest opens that you didn't know about, or you can leave them all in and then the file starts growing and people that should be left off the file, are, uh, deliverability gets hurt, it's, it starts to have files growing, or you could try new metrics like click. 
it was a time where definitely everyone's reevaluating it. And one of the ways that we're thinking is that it's it's a hard problem. You want to be able to get the optimal use out of the file and send the right amount of email. And you've got to be able to get in there and take make this balance between driving revenue tomorrow and and uh, and preserving that list so that you can have conversations. Uh, and we think uh, one strategy is to kind of take the more model-esque approach where you make inferences about how much people are open and you send people the amounts according to what you know about them and how much you think they're going to have in the system. So this is an example of the of what it looks like. Once again, pulled out of the mathy side, I'm the mathematician guy. These are the model controlled send frequencies. So those blue little buckets there, each one of them is a bucket of customers, of some number of customers. Uh, and it's a little histogram of what the system does. And it says that people need different amounts and you're gonna have to evaluate engagement along the lines of how much or one possible solution is to let the system know that if I have partial information, well, I'm forced maybe to send you a little less, but what is the best bet in terms of sending you stuff? Who should be getting an email a day? Who should be getting the most that you can send them? There's people who might get weekly and inactive customer. You might be getting them bi-monthly even if, they're, if you're just trying to test the waters. Uh, out there, and very much so, it's a time to reevaluate how do you want to handle the different types of frequencies, especially in the face of these major changes in the system where engagement, it's going to be hard not to do some kind of inference to kind of get a sense for what's going on in the face of the fact that we're losing this key sort of open signal uh, in the system. But we should think of it as an opportunity, I think, right? But if you're going to think of it as an opportunity, it is a complicated opportunity and you've got to make the process manageable. Uh, this means that opens, you need to, you wanted to say, should I send more emails? Should people be getting two and a half a week versus three and a half or, or, or one and a half a week? You've got to get something where it's really, it has to be flexible. It has to have the notion that it knows and you're able to tell it, wait, this is my big promo event of the month. Everyone should get this. It needs to go to everyone it's applicable or these are not as important. Please manage them. It needs to have some kind of way of, of steering that send volume ship, making sure you're doing a good job. If there's periods where you need more volume, you should have the flexibility. And that flexibility should be integral to testing it. Am I sending the right amount at a file scale? And should I be sending less or more, having some strategic ways of kind of managing that? And we've built some tools to try to help manage this problem. And I think that uh, Chad has offered to talk about uh, an implementation we're, we're, we're doing there along the frequency lines. Uh, Chad? Yeah, sure. Uh, so just to you know speak a little bit about frequency here, we're um, so uh, we kind of approach frequency in our old way as taking um, you know our our full list and splitting it into like a highly active and active and then an inactive group. And so um, when we do that, you know a lot of those different uh, buckets were based on if when somebody was purchasing from us, when somebody was engaging with us, how often was that? And then you fell into one of those groups, right? So that's that's one way to do it, but it really that really doesn't in, take into account how many emails that person wants from you, and how well they're going to react to them when they do get them. So just because you made a purchase recently with us, you maybe you made a purchase yesterday, doesn't mean that you necessarily want to be in our highly active uh, segmentation group. So uh, we've been working with Coherent Path to create a more fluid. Um, segmentation for our frequency optimizations like Greg was talking about um, and definitely are uh, you know excited about where we're going in ter terms of that. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering like how do I really get to a point where I can test what frequency level is right for me and honestly that is a question that I've been trying to solve for for years. Um, it's a very difficult thing if you don't have a system set up to test for it um, to do. And so um, with Coherent Path, um, you know, we've been working toward now, now that we have this capability, uh, we have the ability to um, do frequency testing and create both control and test groups within that so that we can measure what's the lift by sending 20% more email, 20% less, e less email. Uh, what are we doing to our, to our demand? What are we doing, our revenue? What are we doing to our opt-out rates? Like, so that we can start to make some of those decisions and our frequency email frequency isn't just based on what do we think we should send. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing I want to point out there. Um, so, oh, the way that we were handling our inactive group, 
was just to basically pick one day a month and take our full inactive file and blast out to all those people at once. And it uh, really wasn't a great approach because uh, you know, if you know anything about email deliverability, uh, a lot of the email service providers, when you do that, that's a that's a huge red flag, a red flag for um, what's actually uh, for for your deliverability monitoring. So you're going to start to get spam or put in spam folders and block from an email standpoint, um, and so um, that can be a real problematic. So now we have the ability to spread those inactive sends over small batches within our daily sends. Uh, send time personalization um, uh, um, just this kind of falls into the frequency optimization, but finding the right time to send to a person, we've seen a huge lift in being able to do that. And and honestly, it's the, the biggest lift we've seen with the lowest amount of effort. So I really, you know, whatever you can do to try to get to that point where you can find the right time to send to that consumer, uh, it definitely pays off, paid off for us. Um, and then the last bullet point there. Um, kind of speak to some of the um, kind of evolving um, practices in terms of in engagement and tracking. So what I was talking about before our, our um, frequency segmentation was based heavily on engagement. And so that's becoming a little more difficult now with, um, I'm sure a lot of you know about the Apple iOS change that's causing a lot of your emails to appear to be open, but not really. So coherent paths have been super instrumental in helping us come up with a strategy to identify those people and focus more on clicks and, and uh, purchase in terms of signals of, of engagement instead of opens because they're just honestly not reliable anymore. Um, so there's there was actually a few questions that came up from my first slide that I'm just gonna quickly kind of take. Um, so one of the questions was the, the email that I showed, how many variants were there would, would actually be sent with that? And so the question there is, hundreds and hundreds of thousands are, you know, it is really personalized almost at the individual level. I mean, some of those are overlapping, but it, it's potentially an email for every customer in your list, basically. Uh, there was a question about how fresh creative should be and our kind of rule of thumb is we should be adding two new assets to the library every day. That gives us a good um, fresh kind of the, the, the modeling that goes on behind the scenes and the testing that goes on. That's a good number to include certain including the assets at about that rate. So that's that's kind of what we've tasked our team with. Uh, and then the example of that email was an example of our daily email campaign. So that's that's what we set up every day, execute, um, not a trivia or anything like that. So I think that's it. I'll throw it back to you, Greg. All right, thank you, Chad. Uh, and sorry, if you had questions to me, I can't see the question screen while I'm presenting, but I will try to enter them during uh, the session if there are other ones. Uh, I wanted to have one last slide here just to get some sense, because I think from a machine learning point of view, this is a very interesting problem, is that th that how much you send and what you send, they are completely related to each other and they need to inform each other. If you know what to say, you can say things less often. So personalizing can really pay off to control frequency. And when you say things less often, uh, you can have the most relevant conversations. If there's 10 things I could say next month and I know that only five are likely to interest you, then it can, it can, really, it, it can be great to say, well, I only need to send you five. And if I'm only planning to send you five, make sure you're sending the right five. It does mean it's kind of a hard problem in terms of matching up when to send people things along with what to say them. It is a great moment where uh, a computer or machine learning tools can really help you organize the problem and optimize sort of what to do in terms of making that conversation. And just to say, there's a lot more to the conversation than just the how and why, uh, or the how often and what to send. There's, a, there's an enormous uh, kind of list of things in which can help manage the conversation, things ranging from you know why to say something. Do you want to have a conversation about promo or your catalog or branding messages? How to balance those sorts of things over time? Where to say it? In the sense, the emails are very structured. They have a multi-zone component where you can say things at the top and the bottom, but those interact. And and there's a there's a there's a, there's there are things to be thought about and work there. And we're happy to discuss. But I think I've gone over our twenty minutes, so I am going to. I uh, hand it back to Veronica. Awesome. Um, thank you both so much. And actually, uh, I was going to go to the questions, but Chad covered them in, in, in his part of the presentation. So it's perfect. Um, Greg and Chad, thank you so much. Um, 
we will have Greg back on the panel portion. I'm gonna jump into the polls um, and then we'll do the panel discussion. All right, so instant poll time now. Um, it is your turn to answer some questions. Um, and just really quickly, if you're looking for the polls or the poll results, you can find them under polls um, and closed. Those will be the final results. Um, so I have two questions relating to the topic at hand. The first one is what aspects of messaging do you personalize? And I thought this could be a good way to set the conversation for the panel. The options are offers slash discounts, featured products, tone slash voice of messaging, time of send. So the time that you send the emails to the specific people or the, it could be a, a text message frequency of send or something else. And if you pick other, you can select any of the um, any of the six options, but if you click other, we'd love for you to add some color in the chat. So again, what aspects of messaging do you personalize? Offers, discounts, featured products, tone, voice of message, time of send, or frequ frequency of send, or something else. It looks like the majority of you personalize the frequency of send, that's great, and the time of send, um, and from a content perspective, the featured products, um, a fewer, per a smaller percent um, personalize the offers um, and the tone of voice. So I'm gonna close this out. Um, now, our next poll um, is what information do you use to personalize this message? And actually, it, I saw one of the audience members actually ask this question as well. Um, so the options are email slash, slash messaging engagement data, website data slash browse history, purchase history or, or purchase frequency in this case, product lifecycle and replenishment timeline. So if you know a product needs to be replaced every month or so, loyalty program data, survey data, or something else. And again, um, if, if you pick other, um, you can specify that in the chat. We're looking at what information you use to personalize your messaging, the actual email data, the website browse data, purchase history, product lifecycle, loyalty survey data, or other. Um, and for this, a lot of answers to this one, um, it looks like the majority of people, obviously the email system is feeding itself. So you're using email data to personalize the emails um, and, and purchase history as well. Those are the two most popular answers. And then, um, and then after that, it's website browse data. And a few people are using loyalty program data. You have a few people using lifecycle replenishment data um, and a small number using survey data. So we can close that out. Um, a question is going to flash on the screen that I'm going to skip because we're running out of time. Um, but I, and I want to get to the panel. But I do want to ask the question relating to our next webinar, which is on February 9th, and it's focused on collaboration and e-commerce experiences. So um, Scott Silverman's hosting this one, and he wants to, and he wanted to know how would you grade your collaboration across the org to deliver customer experience? Um, and the options are A, best in class, so full collaboration and alignment. Option B is deliver. Um, it's good, but room for improvement. Um, option C is average, and option D is um, the customer said um, our customer satisfaction is suffering due to the lack of collaborations. All right, it looks like the majority of folks are kind of in the middle. Either, um, good, or is the biggest is the um, best answer or the most popular answer, followed by average. So. Um, if anyone wants to be best in class, that's an opportunity to join our next webinar and learn how to do that. Um, and with that, we will jump into the panel portion of our discussion. So if we want to bring everybody up. Hello. Oh, great. So Chad's joining us too. That's perfect. Um, so, um, First of all, I want to welcome you guys to um, to the stage, and I want to have since um, Greg and Chad already presented. I want to have Julie and Jenna introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about um, about your um, email and messaging programs, just so the audience has a little context. Perfect. Um, I'll go. Perfect. 
All right. So hello, everyone. Um, Julie Evans, I'm Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer. I have been at Omaha Steaks for 15 of the last 23 years. And um, I say it that way because I've been back for three years now. It was really, you know, just in time to get caught up and then COVID hit and it really changed everything for Omaha Steaks and our brand. And it really was in um, a good way. You know, uh, customers were staying in, staying home and were turning us to, you know, have their freezer stocked up and, you know, good and yummy food on their tables. So um, it's been a pretty exciting ride the last three years. Um, one of the first jobs I had at Omaha Steaks way back when was um, creating, developing and growing our email marketing. So this is near and dear to my heart still. Um, and for context for this conversation, um, I have my teams centered around the customer. So what is the intent of the marketing and the investment dollars that they manage for Omaha Steaks? So in the simplest form, you know, am I trying to get an update from an active customer or am I trying to reactivate a lapsed customer or am I trying to get a lead that I have to convert into a new customer? So email, text, their arrows in the contact quivers for each of the marketing teams to use and to understand. Their job really is to understand and measure the incremental sales as the cost to play increases, right? You start with, you know, can I reach out to them through, via email and then text? Should I reach them socially? And then we, we are active in, we have telemarketing campaigns, we have direct mail still going on, but as you layer in those more expensive contacts, it's important to understand, you know, not the response just to that investment, but what it does to the overall customer level sales. Um, and uh, let's see. So we have um, <clears throat> we have email and text programs live and well in all of those different audiences for active customers, lapsed customers, and new customers. So. Um, can talk about that. And to Greg's point earlier on, um, we are ripe for big change in our email program, especially we are reimagining the communication with our active customers. And we really see that um, as an opportunity for us in um, 2022. So today I'll be coming at it from sort of our active program and what we're doing there. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Jenna. Nice. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Posner. I'm the VP of Digital at Snipes. Uh, Snipes is a global streetwear company. We're akin to a finish line or Foot Locker. Uh, we entered the U.S. market in early 2019 uh, at around 60 stores, and we are now pushing the envelope uh, just two plus years later, uh, close to the 300 store location mark. So moving really, really quickly. Um, it's. I feel like we're, I, I often say we're on this invisible rocket ship, but it's getting less and less invisible these days. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, what I'll caveat this conversation with, uh, which is kind of a funny black sheep kind of uh, perspective is 80% of our consumers are on mobile. Uh, and so a lot of our strategy has really started leaning into other forms of communication outside of email, uh, like SMS and push notifications. Uh, but what I will say from an email perspective, uh, just fundamentally where we position email is it's really at the core of our omnichannel measurement and execution strategy. So I'm excited to talk about that and how we leverage e-commerce as a data capture strategy and a way to uh, inform triggered communication across all channels. Awesome. Well, welcome. Um, I have a, a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to kind of dig in with you guys, but I wanted to capture a couple more audience questions regarding what Frontgate is doing just since they presented at the at the front end. Um, and there's two questions that are related from Sherry Honig. One is, um, are you isolating Apple Mail? And I don't know if that's probably better served for Greg, but then there's a follow-up question um, that was specifically relating to Frontgate, which was from Sherry, which is due to the lack of unreadability and open rates, how are, how are you segmenting your list? Um, I'm guessing this is relating to the Apple issue. So maybe Greg, do you want to start and then have Chad kind of tack on? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I know that um, I'm not sure 100% what we're doing with Frontgate. I know that the problem is uh, hot on a lot of people's minds right now. Uh, the I, And as I understand the question, one is that uh, we certainly have a way of identifying the the Apple opens and these these what we called nopens, meaning that in it, when you get the data, you can tell that it was through one of those services. So identifying them is part of the game. And then I think the question is, after identifying them, what are two things you need to do? One is that you've identified them, so you have partial information about a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. You're not sure if they're continuing to engage, but you have other signal, like their other engagements. What you know, what they've transacted with, you know, what they've clicked on, you know, their other engagements, which allows you to say. 
the recommendations kind of open up what you think of as your active file, but then personalize it according to how much you know. So if I don't know much about you, you won't get quite as much email because I don't know whether it's a good bet or a bad bet, but you can identify it. It was a little bit to the point that our take is that you're gonna probably have to do something more like high, medium, and low and keep in mind the Apple users in that decision because you have limited information. So if you really know there's engagement, by all means, they should be engaged. And But there's a bunch of Apple people who you don't know and there's a bunch that seem to be engaged but maybe aren't and you have to deal with them uh, with different frequencies and, and have some way of testing into that and thinking about it. That's, that's the way we've been approaching it. And I don't know if Chad wants to talk about any specifics in terms of Apple Opens I, I know that part of the model uses them, so I, but there's also uh, potentially more explicit ways of using it in terms of the data. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to that, but yeah, we've um, just recently started um, switching over so that we can identify um, who those Apple people are, because that's kind of a challenge, first of all. And then um, how, you know, how do we treat um, other metrics like clicks and, and um, purchases uh, as higher priority over like opens because that's really not reliable anymore. I mean, it it definitely kind of um, causes some problem with, you know, we we tend to age people who aren't engaging in our list out, but when it looks like a, this whole group is opening, they, they will stay in your list. So that's the real challenge that we're trying to solve there. Yeah. Um, and I have a feeling a lot of people kind of tuned in because I think, you know, they're struggling to figure out how to create kind of good email health in, in this environment. Um, now, I guess, Jenna, this is the, 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 my first question for you is actually a little bit of a, um, a tee up, but I'm gonna ask you what you've done to optimize your email and or messaging programs. And I'm emphasizing the or messaging because I know from talking to you beforehand that that is really your focus. So do you wanna talk about what you're doing? Yeah, I'll, and I'll lean into email. Um, you know, honestly, we've got some really fantastic use cases that are in play. Um, but at the end of the day, for us, email is a means to an SMS end, right? That's that's where our value really lies. But there's a lot of opportunity in engaging with those consumers that are willing to give up their email. Um, and I'll kind of give you some examples, right? So we know Forrester Gardner says if we make our consumers omnichannel consumers, we're you know we're going to get 300% more LTV out of them, right? So we have a whole we have 300 stores ish, right? We've got all these consumers that are coming in. And we have the concept of an e-receipt in our stores. Consumers willing to hand over their email address, right? To get their order data in their inbox so they don't have to walk around and lose a paper receipt anymore. So we saw that as a massive opportunity to say, well, okay, these are store consumers identifying themselves, sharing with us their email address, giving us access to their order data. How can we leverage that information to better inform how we communicate with those consumers and work to get them to shop cross channel, right? So we have the ability to trigger communications um, with location context, trigger communications with order data, you know, and ultimately the goal here is to watch that email address as a unique ID across both channels to see, okay, we included merchandising that was store specific or region specific within that e-receipt. Did we see that consumer actually transact days or weeks later? And what is the overall combined value of now that customer who's not just a single channel shopper anymore, but shopping across both channels. And once we do that and get that e-commerce and that mobile opt-in, boom, we're off to the races, right? So for us, that email, that interaction, that e-receipt in that store was just the beginning of an omni-channel path for that consumer that was ultimately driven by order data that never would have been, well, not never would have been collected, but would have been much harder to collect and assign to a record if that email wasn't attached to it. So for yeah. us, um, it's been wildly <laughs> successful, and I've actually—I think you—I think we've actually done talks on e-receipt before, yeah. and uh, my yeah, uh, all the all the success still lives on. Um, it's it's been a really good way in, um, and just really forayed into the other modes and methods of communication that we've leaned into, like SMS and and push uh, and all of that. So yeah, it's wow. it's it's been great. Um, and, it's almost and course, like a key for you. Oh yeah, absolutely you right and. And obviously there's all of the historic data that informs it, right? If you buy the boots, we know you're probably going to buy the coat. You know, if you buy the sweats, we know you're going to buy the matching hoodie, right? So there's all the triggered communication. And one thing I will say is that leveraging that data to inform those triggers, trigger communication, whether it's SMS, it's push or it's email, that is where we see hands down the best results from a click-through and conversion perspective. Um, so much better than our one-off communication because obviously there's there's context. So, yeah. 
Awesome. Awesome. So, and that's kind of like very similar to the poll that we had, which is talking about what you're using to feed your personalization. And some of it is you're trying to kind of use your omni-channel personal, per, sorry, purchase experience to then help kind of get people to what's the next logical product that they'll likely purchase. Yeah, um, very cool. Um, Julie, I want to, I want to go to you next because you have really gone through a pretty amazing, um, I guess, I don't know if you want to say transformation, but an upgrade in your whole email system. And I want to talk about personalization and what you're doing to kind of currently personalize that customer journey. Um, you know, I love what Jenna said about the triggered messages really, really working because that's where we're leaning in. So, you know, when I think about personalization, I think about two things. One is sort of the life cycle marketing and really developing those triggered messages. So you have a new customer come on board. You know, what is that contact? What is that experience with our brand, right? On email, on text messages, in telemarketing, and even direct mail. You know, we're talking to them and building our relationship, getting them to really buy into our brand differentiators, you know, and other ways how we can be helpful. So they just bought, you know, some, some yummy steaks. How can we help them, you know, really experience them in a way like no other, giving them recipes for, you know, a pesto sauce or a Bernays sauce to go on that steak. So really delivering that message and using um, like our executive chef, Chef David Rose, to actually deliver um, that message. So those triggered messages from onboarding or maybe in our active file, we recognize the customer who is buying from us every two months. It's been four months now. So why wait for that customer to go lapse to say, hey, where have you been? We have data to tell us that their behavior has changed. So we go in there and we try to intercept that. Or we know based on you know, how much stuff they put in their cooler when they're likely to need a replenishment. So how do we talk about that replenishment order at just the right time? So we are really trying to go from the batch and blast to more triggered messages based on where they're at in their life cycle. So then the other thing we're doing is in those batch and blasts, not treating everyone the same. Um, so really, you know, speaking to them about, you know, products that they love, promotions that they respond to, you know, a price point that we should target. Not everyone is sitting in Nebraska with a big old garage that has two deep freezes in it, right? So some people like don't have space to get a $300 order. They need smaller and to really like um, figure that out and deliver the right sort of price points in our offers to our customers. So, you know, I love what um, Greg said too, you know, if you know what to say, you can say it less often. And, you know, facts are Omaha Steaks, we're an aggressive email marketer. We're on the drug, you know, the more contacts, the more sales, but we're doing lots of frequency testing and cross channel understanding to see, you know, can we send less, but measuring it over time and measuring, you know, sales per customer. What, you know, cause there is some sort of long-term win by being able to communicate with them via email, via text, via push messages, you know, and understanding that over a longer period of time. So, um, so that's some cool stuff we're working on. And we have a new CDP that we, um, that we um, jumped into last year. We spent a lot of time making sure that, you know, the data, the right data was in there and that it was um, validated and that it's, um, super reliable, garbage in, garbage out. We feel like we've got the, the foundation set and we really start using it um, to message our customers in the right way. Awesome. So much to your program. It really seems like you kind of thought about it across all the different kind of um, propensities of consumers to, to purchase to like the products that they want to purchase, it's, which is great. Jenna, did you want to jump in and, and add anything there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think what I will say from our perspective, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with like the hype sneaker business, um, but there is a, a lot of activity out there that isn't authentic, right? Meaning you've got a lot of folks that are out there trying to get their hands on these coveted shoes. And so they're making a lot of burner accounts, right? They're using a lot of fake email addresses, right? It makes our ecosystem very, very polluted. Um, so when it comes time for personalization, you know, one thing we've really done is we've leaned into SMS. Uh, as a resource to do that. And we've done that through a one-to-one -one concierge service where, you know, we'll pixel, uh, we'll pixel the site and understand abandoned browse, abandoned cart information. And we'll actually reach out proactively, well, automated for the first touch, uh, recognizing where the consumer is in their journey on our site and actually engage with them one-to-one -to, -one to answer questions about the product, uh, to promote maybe complimentary items that might go with it or complete the fit. 
Um, it does take a lot of hands-on, right? It's manual. We, we work with Attentive, which actually has an arm of their business that is uh, literally people hands-on keys supporting this concierge concept and the return's been awesome. Those one-to-one -one touches and um, building them into product experts to represent the brands that we carry. It's just been, uh, it's been pretty awesome. So for, for what that recommendation is worth on the personalization side. Awesome. Awesome. Super helpful. Um, I want to shift gears just a little bit and you just talked about it, Jenna, but I want to, I want to double click on that in terms of the data that um, you're using to personalize the experience. And Jenna kind of mentioned browse behavior and complementary products. Julie, um, what are what are you using to to personalize the experience? What kind of data are you collecting about the customers, um, and where are you collecting the data from? Is it from the email, from the browse? You know, um, obviously we have all of our transactional information when a customer transacts, but then we layer on you know their engagement with the emails. You know, putting opens aside for right now, and we're leaning more heavily on the the click activity from our emails, and you know, looking at that trended over time. We pull in browse behavior. Um, and then we also, um, we go to, and we um, layer on third party external data so we can know a little bit more about our customers. And then we create those models, those propensity models about, you know, this customer, it's likely that they will respond to this product or this offer, or you know what, this, this customer, they're new to us, we don't know as much, but they look like they belong in our platinum customer group. So what do we do to kind of bring them along to that customer group? So. Um, we've like, just like everyone, we have so much data. We're trying to, you know, use it in the right way to make the right decisions. Yeah. I can almost imagine that you're like mapping the apartment buildings and you're like, don't send them the bulk, don't promote the bulk orders to those <laughs> places. Cause they probably don't have that second freezer. Um, as opposed to people who live in houses, um, Chad, anything you want to add to that in terms of data? I don't know if you covered that. And I'm trying to remember if you covered that in your presentation, but what kind of data sources do you look at for, for your personalization efforts? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as far as data, we are really trying to optimize. Um, obviously, there's this kind of normal ones like opens, clicks, purchases, um, direct purchases on email is a component. But more and more, we're finding a lot of success from optimize on what we call an attributed revenue and demand and purchases. So mm -hmm. that's not so much looking closely at um, what are we what did we do with that? What did we what did we do with that specific email? What did it drive? It's more looking at the consumers and the subscribers that are in our email file and how are we driving purchase regardless of channel um, by different things we're doing in email. And email is a great place to do that because we can create holdout groups and um, it gives us a way to really drive measurement with that. That's, and that's actually a really good point, that kind of testing into what the actual impact is of a particular um, strategy. And I, I want to turn it over to Greg, because I think, Greg, you probably have a lot of examples of, of data being used and how it's being used from your customers. Um, talk about what else you're seeing in market and um, yeah, any uh, anything unique there. I, I think that um, from my perspective, I think you covered all the databases that I think are <laughs> important for informing the personalization and email, the transaction signal, getting it mapped to your product hierarchy in a sensible in a sensible way is super crucial. The mapping that, that Jen and talked about, but making sure you have a solid ID, making sure that your transaction signal and your email signal are, are mapped to, those are key parts of it. And of course, the, the web tracking data. I think the one comment I would make is we've spent a lot of energy thinking it through that I think is very valuable is knowing that somebody clicked an email is one thing, but it's also good to know what creative did they engage with within that email. Emails are kind of complicated things. And not just what creative, but what context was it in? Was it the thing driving the email? Was it something lower? Those are very important pieces of understanding of, of what the customer's really doing with regard to how to personalize them into the future and how to understand that content so you can use it personalized with other people in the future. So I would say there's sort of an API, a language around messages that everyone on their own is sort of developing in some way to get a handle of what am I looking at when I look at my email data or my web data. And it's, uh, I think it's an interesting problem as a strategic problem to try to think about how do I contextualize my engagement data to get information out that's that's more personalized. And that's an excellent addition because I think we sometimes we we all, we're used to testing creative and ads, but not always thinking about it the same way in email. We think about it as either being a product or or a promotional element. Um, fantastic. Um, 
we, it's like amazing how time flies. Um, one of the questions that we hear a lot, and I want to make sure we cover, is getting people from that first to second purchase. Because I think from a retention perspective, we know that that second people who make that second purchase are far more valuable than people who only make that first purchase. And given that you know over the last two years we've had so many new kind of first time digital customers, I want to ask. I'm going to start with um, Jenna. You know what what are you doing to kind of get people to that second purchase? And then maybe Julie, mm -hmm. you can um, also chime in on that one. I would say nothing, no, no rocket science, right? Um, we're doing the standard welcome series, right? With um, sometimes it'll be a promotion, uh, a percentage off. Sometimes it will be free shipping. Um, kind of shocking how compelling free shipping is for you know the second purchase. Um, uh, but we also really lean into a product driven strategy, right? So we do have a lot of high product. People tend to go where the product is. So we make sure um, that we get those new customers into a journey where they learn about and get communicated with very aggressively when that new high product is going to be available so they can look at us as a source for, again, that coveted sneaker. Um, so that really helps for us as well, alongside kind of standard couponing and promotions. Awesome. Julie, how about, how about Omaha Steaks? What do you guys do to get that second purchase? You know, I think it's a lot of those things that I talked about is, is that, you know, onboarding journey to make sure that we're um, communicating what our brand is all about. Um, but we're talking about it um, within our four walls. So I think what gets talked about gets worked on, right? And the fact that we are really measuring and we have like this 90-day checkpoint in our business, what is our retention rate of a new customer after 90 days? Because that is a marker for you know future LTV. We've tracked it and we if we know what they're at at 90 days, we can predict the future pretty well. And we're actually holding team members accountable for that and talking about it in meetings. And it's really interesting. I think I shared that our teams are set up, you know, I work with our active customers in another area that's out there trying to acquire customers. There's this like lively conversation going on between those two because the customer person will say, hey, you brought me a lot of customers, but none of them are rebuying. Don't go to that source anymore. I like these. So it's really starting those lively, dynamic conversations on our teams that, you know, just it brings me joy to hear like both of the, the teams thinking that way and helping each other deliver the best result for the company. So, th so that's your key metric. Your key metric is retention um, at 90 days. Is there anything else, any other key metrics that folks look at for their email health or success? Oh, no, not at all. And just that is a new one that we've introdu introduced is just that checkpoint there. So we're always talking about, you know, lifetime value, lifetime value. What is the state of our, our file right now? And what is the future value of that? So we always kind of know, you know, if we have this X many customers in our active file, what the future value is, you know, are they platinum, gold, silver? We just, that's just how we named them. Not very creative, but um, so that's what we're watching. It also helps us inform how much do we need to invest in the business to hit, get to our end goals. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're like out of time. I'm going to finish with one question because I know this industry is like booming right now and everyone is growing their teams. So what I'd love before we kind of sign off, I'd love everyone to kind of go around the horn. And if you guys are recruiting in your company, quick, quick place where people can go to learn more about open roles. And um, Julie, I'll start with you and then I'll just kind of go around the screen. Um, yeah, I've got some fun roles open. I have um, an analyst on my customer team that would work on all this fun stuff that I just talked about. I've got a manager on my channel team that really focuses on our web store and then customer insights. You know, it's a year of the customer at Omaha Steaks. You know, we can't make decisions without our customers really telling us what they want. So three big roles, go to our site, careers, and uh, check them out. Awesome. Jenna. Yeah. So uh, LinkedIn, great place to see everything that's uh, alive and kicking from a roles perspective. Uh, what I will say from a, from a Snipes US perspective, we are leaning in heavily into loyalty. We've got some really interesting, creative um, perspectives on what we're going to bring to market in likely 2023, but we are hiring to start um, uh, assigning an owner to loyalty um, and what customer retention looks like long term. Fantastic. Chad, any, any exciting openings at Frontgate? Yeah, so um, we actually, um, right now, we're not really hiring within my team at all. Um, we do, you know, we're part of like Curate, which is HSN and um, QVC. So like there's tons of opportunities with that, within that network. And there's definitely opportunities uh, to be found at Curate.com. Awesome. 
Greg, coherent path. Oh, yes. Uh, I'll just, yeah, <laughs> there's tons of openings. Go to the website and check it out every, every aspect of our business. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. It was never long enough. Julia, Julie, Jenna, Greg, and Chad, thank you so much for sharing your insights with this community. For those that are tuning in from home or from your office, thank you for being here and participating in the webinar. We are back in two weeks on February 9th with our webinar on collaboration and e-commerce experience. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Bye. Thank you.